All right, I guess while we wait, do you want to tell us a little bit about your backdrop right now? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, we're excited. We're coming to you, you know, from Dallas, Texas. This is our headquarters. Our, our, uh, we're sitting here in Biolabs. Right behind me is sort of where all the magic happens. This is where our team of more than 75 PhD researchers work uh, tire tirelessly to try to restore um, species from extinction while also creating amazing technologies to uh, to protect endangered species. And that, that's what we're really excited to talk about with Rewild, our partnership, how we can use de-extinction as a leading conservation tool. And it all starts back here with the amazing genetics, genomics, and cell biology that's happening behind me. That's awesome. Yeah, that, that looks awesome. I would love to come check it out sometime. Yeah, you definitely have to come check it out. I think it's, uh, you know, it's one of, one of those things that gives you sort of chills when you walk in and you see the scale of what's happening and the number of people dedicated to it. And then they talk about the potential of their science. It's really exciting. And uh, for me as a conservationist, it's um, I think maybe the coolest job in the world. That's awesome. So what initially got you interested in Colossal's mission? Well, so I spent the last 15 years of my life um, previous to Colossal working in nonprofit conservation, you know, trying to find ways that we can create sustainable populations of critically endangered species, whether that's working with zoos or conservation organizations focused on field biology, finding ways that we can prioritize um, our resources, our very limited resources in conservation to try to bring species back from the brink of extinction. And when uh, I was first approached about the, the Colossal job by our CEO, Ben, um, you know, I think I had a similar response to maybe everybody at first is kind of amazing and awestru awestruck and then you become a little skeptical. But then once you pull the curtain back and you really understand the potential of what Colossal is doing with, with our technologies, as well as the funding and the attention we're able to develop, it's going to be a real game changer to conservation. And for me to be able to be on, on the team that's going to help change the narrative for biodiversity loss was just too compelling to pass up. Yeah. Yeah, Colossal Scope is just incredible. And like, as as I've been on the Youth Advisory Board for just a couple of months, just hearing what you guys are doing, just yeah. like in, in the limited time that I've been here, it's just incredible. Like the global scope, the partnerships that you guys have. So this one is just gonna add to that. And I'm, I'm very, very excited to hear more about it. No, it's like, I mean, the, the biggest struggle we have here at Colossal is is trying to narrow our focus because we can broaden so quickly. We have so many uh, potential projects, so many species and ecosystems in need, so much amazing technology that in order to try to find a prior, find a way to prioritize where we start is actually really difficult. And that's why we're excited about working with Rewild. They're really a leading organization in sort of the implementation and the assessment of critically endangered species and conservation. So I think that's gonna really help us sort of strategically narrow our focus so we can make immediate impacts while building more and more technologies that have a broader impact. Absolutely. And with that, that is perfect timing. We finally got Barney here. So we Hi, can everyone. get started. Yeah, sorry, you're like technical problems. Yeah, technical issues with these Instagram lives. So I figured before we got into the conversation, we could give each other, give everyone watching an introduction of each of us since we've got multiple different audiences coming in. So uh, my name is Lindsay. I'm a zoologist and science communicator working on bringing the world of evolution and animals to a wider audience. Um, and as of a couple months ago, I'm now on Colos Colossal's Youth Advisory Board. Um, and with that, we can move into Matt, you want to tell us about Colossal and your role? Absolutely. So I'm the chief animal officer at Colossal Biosciences. And, and if you're not familiar with Colossal, we are the de-extinction company. We, our mission is to make extinction a thing of the past. And for me, that's really a two-fronted war. One is you know, creating technologies to bring species back from extinction. And that's what we talk about all the time. That's working with, with mammoths and thylacines and dodos. And how can we restore functions that were lost through extinction to an ecosystem in need? Um, but at the same time, we're developing technologies on that pathway that have direct implications to critically endangered species. So in my role, one of the amazing privileges and honors I have is to get to direct our conservation projects and how we can kind of um, address critically endangered species today. And so that's really where my focus has been and is what drew me to Barney. All right, and Barney, you want to take it away? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Barney Long. I'm the Senior Director of Conservation Strategies at Rewild. And part of my role here is to head up the species program. Um, similar to what Matt was just saying, um, our mission is to uh, make sure there's no extinctions or further extinctions on this planet. Um, and as Rewild, we, we 
uh, aim to protect and restore the wild. Um, and part of that obviously is our species program. And so because we're working so hard and focused on preventing extinctions, teaming up with Colossal made a lot of sense because um, we both think extinction should be something of the past. That's awesome. And so from my understanding, you guys have been talking about this partnership for a few years now, and it's finally happening. But I would love to hear more about those initial ideas that you had, um, what drove you to each other. So Matt, do you want to take it away? What drove you to a partnership with Rewild? Yeah, it's sort of as I alluded to earlier is one, one of the things that we're really um, uh, troubled with, and which is a great problem to have, is that we have so many different potential projects that we could focus on, so many ways that we could apply our technologies in a meaningful way to species in need. Um, but that becomes a prioritization challenge. And Rewild is one of the leading organizations in the world when it comes to conservation planning and implementation. And so early on, we identified Rewild as someone that we should be aligned with, somebody that we could um, work closely with in order to provide guidance for how we can leverage technologies in the most meaningful way for, for nature. And so my first few conversations with Barney were really exciting. It's sort of, you know, kid in the candy store stuff when we start talking about, you know, where can we go with these things? What are the dreams we both have for species? What's your favorite sort of conservation project? What's the species you'd love to see, um, you know, saved first? That, that was really fun. And Barney and I have a ton of alignment um, we're really, you know, we're sort of cut from the same cloth when we, when we think about conservation. And so there was obviously a, a strong foundation to build on. The challenge in building a partnership like this comes, comes around when you start thinking about how do you each play your role within this and, and where do we go together? And, you know, luckily Barney and I sat down uh, with our teams and, and in really an amazingly short period of time, we were able to hammer out a 10 year conservation plan for how we think uh, colossal and rewild should be behaving in the conservation space and what species we could impact and so i think that was really a testament for what a strong partnership we have and how much alignment there is between our two organizations yeah there's definitely a lot of aspects to conservation that you guys have um between you two barney adding de-extinction technology to what you guys are doing is a pretty big jump um so what were your first ideas of that well you know, for me, every single day I'm working on species uh, that are really on the edge of extinction, you know, down to the last few handfuls of individuals. Um, and so every day you're trying to think through how you can save those kind of species. And yes, we have our traditional conservation methods such as managing protected areas, parks, nature reserves, anti-poaching, habitat management, etc. Um, but we're also working with um, uh, other partners um, that look at the conservation breeding side of things, especially uh, zoos and aquarium partners. And they're really working on making sure we have those breeding populations of animals under human care um, so that we can eventually put them back into the wild and bolster those, those populations that are in the wild and in such small numbers. And so when we started talking to Colossal, the idea of using new technologies, bringing in new tools into our toolbox to help these species, looking at those conservation breeding programs and how we can speed them up through some of these technologies or re restore lost genes into populations to kind of walk back inbreeding, et cetera, just opens up a huge amount of really exciting possibilities and new tools in our toolkit for, for saving and recovering endangered species. And this 10 year plan is awesome. And there's a lot of questions that came with it and, you know, um, what the possibilities are with this plan. So I actually opened it up to my community on Instagram stories and my YouTube community post yesterday to get some questions from the audience. Um, and so I want to start it off with a question from a string of letters and numbers i'm not gonna <laughs> spell it out um they asked how will de-extinction tech help with conservation so you know we've kind of talked about it already but maybe going more direct into that i think it's really important and, and one of the things that i talk about all the time is sort of that de-extinction and conservation are innately interwoven there is no way to separate de-extinction from from conservation de-extinction is a tool of conservation and it's an emerging science that we're building that sort of paves the road ahead so we can anticipate uh, how to respond to future extinctions or near extinctions. Um, the extinction creates this sort of engine of innovation and funding and interest 
that spins out amazing tangible applications to conservation um, uh, crises of today. So V Extinction becomes sort of a uh, incubator as such to develop technologies to address critically endangered crises right now. Awesome. And with those critically endangered species, um, Sam Nico 99 wanted to know what species are at a high priority with this new project? We've got a whole range of species that we've already identified that we want to work on together. Um, if you go to our, our new joint uh, website, you will see all of those. Um, but we're also obviously looking into the future as well, and, and we're open to talking uh, to partners all over the world about other species. But some of the species we're already working on um, and talking about, um, I'll let Matt speak to some of them. But from my point of view, um, we have been working with the Indonesian government for the past year, thinking through what is needed for the Sumatran rhino. Um, it's one of the species very, very dear to my heart when Matt talked about how excited we get about certain species. This is certainly one for me. Um, and there we're, we're looking to help our Indonesian colleagues um, to develop the technology and, and tools that they can use to bring this kind of genetic rescue approach to the Smart and Rhino breeding program that the, the government of Indonesia is leading on. And, and I think what's great about our partnership and in, in the idea of marrying a de-extinction company with, a, with an amazing conservation NGO like this is that de-extinction cannot occur without a lot of work in conservation and restoration ahead of time. We cannot rewild species back out into the wild unless those, those habitats have been prepared to receive those animals, which means we have to address hundreds of different forces that drove a species to extinction, whether that's invasive species or that's habitat restoration. Um, we're working with Rewild to identify those pathways today. So even though we have a very species focus, it ends up becoming a, an ecosystem problem. And so we have to address the entire ecosystem. So in places like Tasmania, how do we address invasive species? How do we work with local stakeholders to ensure that this is socially responsible and there's, and there, there's sort of a core group of people that are in support of this? And that's where Rewild and Colossal can work really well together in order to sort of pave the road ahead while Colossal develops technologies to restore species from extinction. That's awesome. And that was actually the perfect transition into the next question from Garfield7131, who wants to know examples of specific measures that will be taken in order to make sure reintroducing a species somewhere won't completely disrupt the ecosystem there. Yeah, well, when you think about an ecosystem, an ecosystem, we often talk about it as the web of life. Um, every single species in that ecosystem has a place in that ecosystem and an important role. And when you take one species away out of that web of life, the web gets a little bit weaker. And so when we talk about reintroducing species, you're talking about putting species back into a place where they once were to fulfill their ecological role within that ecosystem. So in effect, you're rebuilding that, that web of life. And so a species should not be disrupting an ecosystem when you're putting it back into a place where it once was and sh still should be if it wasn't for humans uh, removing them. Um, with that in mind though, we do uh, follow very, very strict guidelines on when we are doing reintroduction programs. They're not something that you can do overnight. They take years, if not decades, to plan out properly and implement. And there are really clear guidelines on how to do this. They're set out by an organization called the IUCN Species Survival Commission, which is a bit like the UN of conservation of species. Um, and so any conservation programs that we uh, will do will very closely follow these reintroduction guidelines. So these include things like looking at the ecological feasibility. They will look at the uh, threats that drove the species away in the first place, make sure those threats aren't there. So when you put the species back, it's safe. But they'll also look at the social and political side of things. Um, so we'll work very closely with local stakeholders on, on the decision-making process. We use something called FPIC, which is free prior informed consent. We would never put an animal back into an area uh, without that um, consent of the local communities, especially their indigenous communities. So reintroduction programs are very long term, very complicated programs, um, and we'll have to take them step by step over the next years. Awesome. Um, so kind of going more into that, um, how are the local communities included in the projects or future projects that you guys have? That's from Elam S3873. Oh. 
Well, we have amazing initiatives like what's happening in Tasmania right now. We've, for the last two years, been working with a Tasmania thylacine advisory committee. So those are local stakeholders from government, industry, and community representatives, including Aboriginal representatives, that have a voice and get to help direct um, this, this thylacine reintroduction program. As Barney mentioned, it's an immense undertaking. There's so many variables that we have to take into account and that we have to plan for, but it really starts with the local stakeholders. They, they must be on board, not just on board, but a part of the solution and they must benefit from the solution. So that's really where you know, projects like that advisory committee are, are, are coming in. It's becoming a model for the way that we're going to move forward with almost every program that we have. That's awesome. And just to be clear, when we're running rewilding programs like this, we'll be working through local organizations. So we'll find local conservation groups, community groups, indigenous groups, and we'll work with them and it will be their project on the ground and we will be supporting and advising, et cetera. Um, but we really want this to be a bottom up process for any reintroduction program. That's awesome. One thing that we haven't really touched on is the lost species program. You guys are planning to go on missions to look for dozens of lost species. Um, and so a lot of people are wondering what lost species you guys are on the lookout for. Well, yeah, the Lost Species Program has uh, been a, a long-standing program of Rewild, and it's something that we're really excited about. You can't protect something, uh, you can't conserve something unless you know that it still exists and where it is. Um, and critically, that you've got local organizations and individuals that are interested in that species and working on its protection. And so the Lost Species Program has been really focused on finding those local individuals that can look for and find lost species um, and therefore catalyze conservation actions for them. Um, we partnered with Rewild on our most wanted list, which is the 25 most wanted lost species. And that's the, the focus of this search. They range from sharks to spiders, to seahorses, um, to monkeys. Um, so there's a whole range of, of those species that we'll be looking for. And we're really excited to, to get some expeditions out um, and hopefully find some lost species and put them on the road to, recover, to recovery. I think this is the, one of the most exciting parts of our collaboration because it's expedition. And, you know, the little kid in you really gets excited when you talk about you know, going to a remote land and getting to sort of rough it and go search for something that nobody thinks exists anymore. And what's amazing about that is it's not only fun and adventurous, but I could almost promise you on any one of these lost species expeditions, if we don't find the exact species we're looking for, you'll almost always find something new or interesting to science that, that we didn't know was there or we thought was also lost. And so, you know, an amazing project, I think that's gonna be, uh, uh, you know, one of the highlights for me for this partnership. Yeah, that's, that's so cool. I mean, what is it estimated? There's like millions of species that haven't been discovered yet. So millions of possibilities. So that's really cool. Um, all right. So the last question that I have on here is from Dragonheart97. They want to know if you could choose what animal would you want to de-extinct? Well, maybe Barney should start because I sort of work at a company where we're doing that every day. <laughs> Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, I could think of tens, if not hundreds, that I would love to, to bring back. Um, for one, for me, which is really close to my heart, is, is the coupre. Uh, this is a wild cow um, from Cambodia. Um, and it went extinct. Well, officially, it's not extinct on the red list of threatened species just now, but it has not been seen for about 40, 50 years and is very highly likely extinct. Um, but for me, it is a species that epitomizes a part of Eastern Cambodia, um, which is just an amazing part of the world and that I've been lucky enough to work in. Um, it's also the national animal of Cambodia, so has a lot of pride. And I think by restoring a species like that, um, we'll have to try get it on the list, Matt. Um, but by trying to restore a species like that, I think you could also use it as a figurehead or a flagship for protecting an entire ecosystem and landscape. This is a, a landscape, it's the only landscape in the world with historically four species of wild cattle. It's where tigers and 
leopards used to roam um, and used to be called the Serengeti of Asia for its large congregations of deer and wild cattle, etc. And I would love to see that landscape restored. And so again, as Matt said earlier, this although we take a species focused approach, this is very much about restoring ecosystems um, for the good of the planet, for the good of biodiversity and for the good of humans. And so I really feel that restoring something like the Cooper could lead to much bigger implications. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great answer because uh, just for that landscape purpose alone, I mean, we're talking about one of the most uniquely diverse areas in the world that's been heavily impacted uh, by human activity. So finding ways to restore species that helps drive conservation across an entire landscape like that in Southeast Asia would be amazing. For me personally, I uh, sort of fell in love with conservation with, with African antelope. I've always been enamored with antelope and, and, and Southern Africa is a beautiful place. And, and there's a species that came from the Cape of South Africa called the blue buck that went extinct several hundred years ago or 200 something years ago. And, uh, and that was purely due to anthropogenic human forces, right? Uh, so that blue buck is sort of uh, at the top of my list for a species I'd love to see restored. It's known for having this beautiful steel gray coat. That's awesome. But that's well, a fantastic question. So um, with that, we might have two new species on our list that aren't public yet. So um, <laughs> Lindsay, keep asking that if, question uh, and the list will get bigger and bigger. <laughs> Lindsay, what, we'd, we'd be interested to know maybe what your uh, species of choice would be. I mean, I think you guys have a much better grasp on like recently extinct species than I do. My favorite extinct species is Paraceratherium from like 5 million years ago. Nice. So that's not going to happen, but I would love to see them. They're like giant rhinos that were, yeah. you know, 20 feet high and that, that would be really cool to see. Um, but maybe something more recent. Now, that's <laughs> really cool. If, form. if we were to be able to wind the clock all the way back, something like Glyptodon, right, which was a giant armadillo from South America, you know, Central America, something like that, I think would also be just amazing. Yeah, yeah, that would be really cool. I know it's it's weird to imagine them walking around today. Yeah. Um, so before we finish this live, I would love to hear what you guys are most excited for with this partnership. Um, you guys have a lot in common. We went over a lot of different questions that you guys had similar answers on, but what are you most looking forward to with this? I think, um, you know, I've been so enamored with Colossal since I joined the team two and a half years ago. I've been talked to, I've talked to people about how I sort of felt, feel like an evangelist and going out and spreading the gospel of Colossal because I truly believe in our mission. I truly believe that the technology and the tools that we're developing every day are going to be world changing for biodiversity loss conservation. Um, that said, I think partnering with a group like Rewild helps us mainstream these ideas that feel very progressive today. But I think in 10 years time, we'll look back at this and understand that this was sort of this intersection of time and opportunity that developed something really unique and created an amazing opportunity to mainstream a tool. And we'll sort of laugh and giggle, I think, about how controversial it was in the beginning and how mainstream it is in 10, 20 years time. Yeah. Uh, kind of on a similar vein for me, I, mean, I work with species that are right on the edge of extinction every single day. And, and sometimes it can be a little depressing, to be honest. Um, and I think this partnership is, is opening up really optimistic visions for the future of how we can recover species, put them on a much faster trajectory of recovery. Um, and just seeing that come to fruition um, as proof of concept with whichever species it ends up being first. Um, to demonstrate that this technology really can have an impact for conservation and the recovery of species. That, that to me is, is what I'm really excited about. And once we get that first one done, how do we scale that and replicate that so we can really make an impact across the world for species conservation? I'm so excited to see where this partnership goes and how this technology is used. So thank you guys so much for being here to talk to me and thank you for everyone watching and asking questions in the comments. Um, this was a great live, thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Lindsay. Yeah, thanks very much. Great to see everyone. Bye, right. guys. Okay.